In the old days of D&D, they were called thieves. But in Lamentations of the Flame Princess, we know them as the Specialist. All right, guys, I have been looking forward to this one since I cracked this book open. I have always loved thieves, or in more modern editions of D&D, rogues. I always thought that they were really cool. I always thought that the idea of an adventurer with a lot of different skill sets was a really cool thing. And how the specialist is handled in this game is also really cool. So let's get into it. Let's learn a little bit more about the specialist and how you can customize yours to make them your dream adventurer. Fighters are adventurers because they're so inured to death that they cannot settle down to a normal life. Magic users are those that have pursued the dark arts and are no longer welcome in society. Clerics are charged by their god to go forth and perform their special duties. Specialists, they do it because they want to. Whether inspired by greed, boredom, or idle curiosity, specialists are professional explorers risking life and limb simply because a less active life is distasteful to them. In some ways, this makes them the only sane and normal adventuring characters, but in other ways, it makes them the most unusual. The specialist is unique because the character class has no special abilities of its own. Instead, a specialist is better at certain activities that all characters are able to do at a basic level. The specialist begins at the same default level in these activities as other characters, but receives points which can be allocated to improve his ability in the chosen skills. The available skills and their default starting values for all characters are Architecture Bushcraft Climb Languages Search Sleight of Hand Sneak Attack Stealth Tinker most of the rules covering these skills can be found in the Adventuring Rules of the Game section of this book. For skills that are X in 6, allocating a point increases the chance by 1. For example, languages begins at 1 in 6. A specialist allocating a point to this skill increases his chance to 2 in 6. So, here's my thought on this. The skill system in older editions um, really didn't kick in like mechanically and very strongly um, until like third edition. That's where kind of skills and proficiencies really kicked in. Now, some of you older masters might be saying, Bill, uh, first edition AD&D had secondary skills. Yes, they did, but those were kind of more like flavor skills, and I don't know how much they truly mechanically impacted the game. Um, whereas I think with these, what they've done in Lamentations is kind of picked out the core adventuring skills where everybody has a one in six chance of doing them and some classes have a few of these other things. But a specialist can allocate and choose to specialize in certain things, thus kind of improving their odds with some of these specific things, which is what I really like. It's, it's a bit of character customization. And it's in the word, specialist. You are specializing in a certain skill or maybe a set of skills. For other characters, sneak attacks are merely attacks made by surprise. A specialist can multiply the damage done by a sneak attack by allocating points to this skill. Assume that the damage multiplier is times one for all characters, but for every point allocated to the skill by a specialist, the damage multiplier is increased by one. If a specialist has any points in sneak attack, then he also gets a plus two bonus to hit above any other bonuses he already has when performing a sneak attack. When use of an ability is attempted, the player must roll a d6, and if the result is equal to or less than the ability, the action is successful. In some cases, the referee will make the roll if the character would not immediately know if he was successful. For example, the character will easily be able to tell if he has successfully picked a lock or not, so the player can make that roll. On the other hand, the character would not know after searching for traps if he has failed to find a trap, or if there simply is not one present. In this case, the referee will make that roll. I want to pause here and reflect on that last bit. Because a lot of times, 
in role playing games. Um, at a table, a, a player makes a role for their character. And they know based on that role whether they succeeded or failed. And I think what's very subtle but also crucially important here is in this system, some of those roles, the player shouldn't know whether it was successful or not. It's up to the referee or the DM to know that and to reveal it and how they reveal it. And what's important about that variation is that it basically blocks metagaming. Now, in a perfect world, every player would role play their character, right? Regardless of the die and the result, they would role play that as if their character knew or did not know, for example, about the existence of traps. But the reality is that even the most experienced players can sometimes metagame and actually because of the die roll, they, you know, they discover that they don't know whether or not there's a trap, so they try to find some other way around. As opposed to a secret die roll made by the referee and the player doesn't actually know, so they have to trust their DM or referee. There's a little bit of a interpersonal kind of table etiquette element there. But I think this really does help to keep your game immersive and to keep your players in certain circumstances like this example from metagaming. The specialist must be unencumbered to use any of the class abilities involving movement or suffer a one point skill penalty per level of encumbrance. They must have specialist tools to, to use search for finding traps or to use tinker for opening locks or other such activities. Now, what I'd like to do is take a look at the actual operations in game. So when you flip over to um, page 31, adventuring, the rules of the game, alphabetically they break down kind of typical adventuring situations, right? Starting with architecture. So architecture is one of those skills that a specialist can allocate points to to improve their odds. And you might be like, well, what's the point of architecture so that you can appreciate the difference between a ionic and Doric column? Um, there's me flexing my fine arts degree. No, the, the value of architecture is actually in your dungeoneering skill set, right? So the ability to identify specific things maybe related to architecture or engineering, that, that sort of thing is valuable. So let's take a look. Clues, warnings, and rewards can be built into the very structures of a character's surroundings, determining if a certain portion of a structure was built at a different time than the surrounding construction, determining if a passage shifts or slopes gradually, detecting if a particular structure is unsafe to travel in, determining what culture or even specific method of construction was used for a specific structure. All of these things and more can be important in keeping explorers alive and or helping them achieve their goals of unlocking ancient mysteries. So I guess that that kind of has to do with a lot of things, right? Like maybe that would indicate um, the existence of secret rooms or secret doors or um, like the kind of traps where like a, a stairway, you know, turns into a slide and they, they slide into a spiked pit. So kind of all of those things. Um, maybe a secret tomb. I could see a clever referee um, making a lot of really cool descriptive elements available so that a, a player character with architecture could take advantage of that skill. I could see it being a very cool um, explorer ability, right? Like whether it's dungeons or ruins or just an enemy castle that you have to infiltrate whatever that might be, a prison, you know, they're doing a jailbreak mission. Um, architecture could be really cool. Okay, the next one alphabetically is climbing, and climb is one of those skills that a specialist can handle. All characters have a base of one and six to use the climb skill, which allows a character to climb walls and other sheer surfaces without obvious handholds. Characters must be unencumbered to make this attempt. Failure means that the character falls from a random point in the climb. Okay. Characters with two free hands can climb ropes and ladders with no die roll needed. So there's another example of the specialist. When you have to climb something and you don't have a ladder or a rope, if you have points allocated and climb, you can free climb a lot of cool things. Foraging and hunting. 
Characters may be able to find food and water during their journeys over land. To find food in the wilderness, the character must roll against his bushcraft skill with terrain, modifying the skill as follows. Okay, so foraging and hunting is covered under bushcraft, which is cool. So you want to make that ranger type of character, then you focus on bushcraft. Um, that survivalist, you know, the hunter, all those guys would be, you know, pumped up with a few points allocated into bushcraft. Languages. Most characters are assumed to be in play, being fully fluent in their native tongue and are literate as well if they have an intelligence of seven or greater. Elves and dwarves will know the local human tongue in addition to the tongue of their particular clan. Um, when a character comes into contact with another language, his chances of knowing the language is one in six. If you want to make a specialist who isn't really the sneaky, trap-disarming, uh, lock-picking thief, you could make a, you know, a specialist who's really learned, which would also be immensely valuable on an expedition or exploration kind of adventure. Searching. A one in six chance of things being found. Search skill is greater than one in six. Use that base chance to find something during a search. That might be the most clutch skill for any specialist. Or if you have multiple specialists in a party, somebody should have a high search. Now, I, I guess here's a question for those of you who know the game better. Could a referee say that a player could roll architecture in some instances to find a hidden uh, or secret door instead of search? My argument would be maybe yes, if that secret door or secret room or hidden door was somehow related to the architecture or engineering of a given location. I think that I would like allow that as a home rule thing. But for sure, search can be used for a lot of other things other than just finding secret doors. So that's cool. All right, sleight of hand, the traditional thief skill. Picking the pockets of an unaware person, hiding a small object from a search, readying a weapon without any observers noticing, swapping out an object on a weight-sensitive plate with a similarly weighted bag of sand, a la Indiana Jones. These and more are examples of sleight of hand. Let's think outside of the box for a second. If you don't really care about picking pockets, is sleight of hand still useful? My answer would be, um, based on this, yes. Absolutely. When I played Pathfinder, first edition Pathfinder, one of the first characters I made was a knife master. And I loved that that came with not only heightened abilities with knives, but the ability to sleight of hand those knives. So, you know, if you were in a city and the guards or constables stopped you, you could, you know, quick pop your blade up your sleeve kind of thing. Um, and maybe avoid being searched because you don't have any obvious weapons. Uh, but also things like swapping other things out, weight-based things. Um, I could see that being really valuable. Okay, stealth. Stealth allows a character to sneak around and hide. In order to use the stealth skill, those that the character wishes to hide from must not already be aware of the character's presence, and there must be somewhere to hide. Stealth is not invisibility. That's probably common sense to most of us who've been gaming for a while, but I think for a lot of people who maybe come from a video game background or like an MMO background, where you could be like stealth and just kind of disappear in front of a crowd of people, it doesn't work like that. For example, if the character hears enemies coming down a bare hallway, he would not be able to simply hide because of the lack of available cover. In a room with furniture, the character would be able to use stealth to hide, but if someone were to conduct a search of the room, the character would be found. If a character attacks after successfully using stealth, that attack is always considered to be a surprise attack, even if the enemy is already engaged in battle. Yeah, that makes sense. Because they might be fighting, you know, this orc might be fighting Krafa, but they, they didn't see me, and then I pop out of the shadows and stab the guy in the back. I should still get the, uh, the element of surprise. Okay, Tinker. I find this interesting because when I think of Tinker, I think of like gnomes in D&D who make like cool little clockwork things. But this, this I think is a little more spelled out and the uses for it might be greater. Manipulating small mechanical objects is an activity called tinkering. Tinkering is often used to open locks or remove small mechanical traps. Note that only mechanical locks 
where the character has access to the keyhole or other opening mechanism are able to be manipulated in this manner. Only traps which have been found and which have a mechanism that is accessible to the character can be disarmed. For example, a tripwire is a trap which a character can attempt to disarm, as is a lock with a poison needle. A pressure plate, which when pressed collapses the ceiling, would be an example of a trap that the character could not disarm because the mechanism itself is behind the walls, floor, or ceiling. That's uh, another example of how this game clearly spells out what you can and can't do, which is so often overlooked in other games. There's so many questions online in other games about, hey, can I do this with that? And like here they basically head on directly address what you can and can't do with common examples that, that show up in games a lot. I love that. Other uses of tinkering setting traps, for example, or jury rigging impromptu devices should be adjudicated by the referee on a case-by-case -case basis. A character gets one attempt to use tinkering on any particular object. If that one attempt fails, the character must gain a level before <laughs> attempting to manipulate that object again. And the reason why I'm laughing is because so often in games, the people in the games will be like, I try again, I try again, I try again. And even if you put like a time thing on it, like, all right, you have to wait 10 minutes. They're just gonna keep rolling until they get it. So I like that they can't just do that. That's kind of cool. Um, so tinkering, hugely valuable, right? That's your, that's your disarm um, capability right there. That's your thieves tools of the more modern era. I feel like if a trap was intrinsically linked to or noticeable by an examination using architecture, I would homebrew allow architecture to substitute for search when it comes to traps that are related to the physical properties of a, of a room, of a man-made space. That's my own take on that. And if you don't like it, F you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, all right, so that, that kind of goes over some of those basic things. All of those are really cool. Now, a starting specialist gets four points to allocate. You could spread out those points, you know, maybe take, throw a point into stealth, throw a point into sneak attack, throw a point into search, and throw a point into tinker, right? And now you've got your basic guy who could find things, stab people, sneak, and disarm traps. You got your basic thief with a two in six chance on each of those instead of a one in six. So not bad. You could go hardcore and put all four of your first level points into one thing. Like you could be, you know, the, the stealth master. You throw all those in there, right? Now you're just stealth, stealth, stealth. And part of me thinks like, would it work in this game to have like three specialists and then like a fighter and a cleric, let's say? Would that work? Well, building a whole party, that's, a, that's another topic maybe for another video. But I think when it comes to what I've read so far of the classes available in Lamentations of the Flame Princess, the, the specialist is my favorite so far. And I think it's my favorite because I, I can imagine a bunch of really cool, fun characters that I can make. Let me know what you think about this video. And if you have awesome ideas for specialist builds in this game, Maybe you're the most optimized person on the planet. You know how to build the best specialist at first level and how to scale that specialist if they survive all the way through level 20 and which points to allocate at which levels. Post it in the comments and share it with the community so we can learn from your wisdom, powerful grognard. But in the meantime, peace out, happy gaming, and try not to die.